Hello, this is Prophet Six, uh, family prophet to the angel of the church to the Laodiceans. God bless you. We're going to be studying the Sabbath school lesson today, lesson 12, Christ's church and the law. Now, I have skipped over lesson 11, which was the apostles and the law. I just skipped over that one. I just got busy and hogtied, and for lack of a better term, and uh, uh, even though I lost 25, 30 pounds, <laughs> um, I skipped over verse 11. And uh, it's not that God hasn't given me nothing that I could not say about lesson 11, just was just busy, you know. But uh, I do want to be consistent, and I want to be able to give you all some relevant meat and due season um, word as it relates to these lab Sabbath school lessons. These Sabbath school lessons take a lot of work. They really do. And uh, much preparation. And now, sometimes I'm able to give these lessons without any preparation because I just peruse the lesson and and I look for the pertinent points and the Lord will quicken quicken me and I'm able to you know give you a lesson and I'm doing the best I can um, but I want to do better that's my motto in life but let's look at lesson 12 let's begin with a word of prayer father in heaven we thank you so much we thank you so much, Lord, for allowing the children of Satan and the children of kingdom, of the kingdom of God to be mingled together in order that the, 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 the devils in human form might see and get a glimpse of Christ through the wheat and be converted. We know, God, that all the tares are never going to be converted. We know that. And we know, Lord, that as we love on the tares and war against the demonic influence of these demons in human form, we pray, Lord, that there will be a harvest that will eclipse that which happened in the days of the apostles when the wheat and tares were mingled in the early Christian church. Lord, give us the grace, the wisdom, the spiritual acumen, Lord, to reach these lost souls and not lose our own as we are wheat. Oh God, forgive us of our sins, both the wheat and the tares. For, Lord, we know that the difference between the wheat and the tares is not sinlessness. But the difference is that one is born again, one is not. And that Christ in the life of the wheat is what makes them different than the tares. Demons in human form. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Look at this, people. Lesson 12, Christ and the law. Let's look at uh, Genesis chapter, Genesis chapter 2. Verse 16. Now, this, this is a lot of scriptures here. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, of every tree of the garden, thou mayest freely eat. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. And the Lord God said, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet for himself, for him. 
And out of the ground, the Lord God formed every beast of the field, every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam. To see what he would call them. And whether soever Adam called every living creature. That was the name thereof. Oh boy. I want to tell you something. When I read. I, well, I'm excited. <laughs> when I read Genesis chapter 1 and 2. Now I know we only read gen a part of Genesis chapter 2. But when I read Genesis chapter 2. All I get, all I can hear is kingdom. That's all I can hear. The kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. All I can see is the good news of the kingdom. Now, some look at the good news of the kingdom as only being redemptive. But I see that the good news of the kingdom, it started all the way back in Genesis 1-1. <laughs> Ooh, thank you, Holy Ghost. Thank you, Holy Ghost. That's what I see. The gospel of the king, you know, you know, that you know, among evangelicals, there's a debate that the gospel of the kingdom of heaven and the gospel of the kingdom of God are two different things. When I look at Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3, all I see is the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of the heaven. Kingdom of heaven. It's the same thing. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is the same thing. Watch this. What makes, what makes heaven heaven? The presence of God. God. <laughs> That's what makes heaven heaven. Heaven. How are you going to separate those two people? By over analyzing and over interpreting scriptures. It's, it's amazing. You can't have heaven without God, and you can't have God without a kingdom or heaven. You can't have it. But there are those that teach. The kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven is two different things. The kingdom of heaven is within you, and the kingdom of God is, is, is you know, you know, somewhere else. It, it doesn't make sense. If the kingdom of heaven is somewhere else, that means you don't have the kingdom of God. And if the kingdom of God is somewhere else, that and, and, and they are separate components, that means you don't have heaven. That's what heaven is. God is heaven. If the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, what are we going to say about heaven? We would have to say the same thing. Heaven is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. How are you going to have earth without God? And how are you going to have God without a kingdom? I'm speaking in the Holy Ghost. Some of this, y'all, is going right over y'all head. It's going right over your head. But think about it, people. The kingdom of God is one thing and the kingdom of heaven is something else. Come on, people. If Watch this, y'all. If the kingdom of God is one thing and the kingdom of heaven is another thing, that means John the Baptist got killed twice. <laughs> that means John the Baptist got killed twice. That means John the Baptist baptized Jesus twice. Because in Matthew and in Mark, these two stories are recounted and in one instance, is it is called the kingdom of heaven. In the other instance, it is called the kingdom of God. So are we going to say now that John the Baptist got killed twice, beheaded twice? Jesus got baptized twice by John the Baptist? That would have to mean that Jesus had, John the Baptist had to come back from the dead and baptize Jesus again. So people, it is ridiculous, ridiculous. 
This is the work of Satan. He don't want us to know what the kingdom of God is or the kingdom of heaven. He wants there to be some mysticism. I digress. And Adam gave names to all the cattle and to all the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a help meet for him. And the Lord God caused the deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall become, shall be one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Lord gave me a revelation about this scripture. A man shall leave his mother and father and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Let me unpack that for you because we're destroying families. Oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Help us, God. Forgive us, Lord, of our sins. Oh, this is abomination. We are destroying families left and right. And if you can't build a family, you certainly can't build a kingdom. Oh, I'm going to give, oh, and speak in the Holy Ghost right now. I'm going to speak in the Holy Ghost. If I never spoke in the Holy Ghost before, look at this. <laughs> Thank you, Jesus. Look at this, people. In the West, where we should have the clearest view of Familyhood and kingdomhood, we don't. Especially Christians. Christians have no greater notion of familyhood and kingdomhood than do the heathen that live in America. We don't. Look at this, people. Um, you know, my intro is. Prophet 6, the family prophet to the angel of the church, to the Laodicean. That's how I start off. Prophet 6, the family prophet to the angel of the church, to the Laodiceans. To the angel of the church. That's the leadership. The leadership. The tear-ridden leadership of Laodicea. Okay? Now, how are you going to build the kingdom? When you interpret this scripture right here, in verse 24, Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall cleave unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. And they were... How are you going to interpret that scripture as, okay, you leave your kingdom. Now your mother and your father is born again. You got parents that are seeking first and only, and yes, yeah, seeking first the kingdom of God. Look at any video that I've ever, look at any video where I say this, and you will see that seek ye first the kingdom of God means seek only, exclusively, that which is promoting, galvanizing, and multiplying the kingdom of God, that which will. How are you going to read this scripture? But you quote in Matthew 6.33. How are you going to quote this scripture? But believe that when your children get 18 and you send them off to college and 80% of our children as Christians, as professed Christians, raising professed Christian homes, 80% of them leave the faith, never come back in their lifetime.
And whether or not they come home with straight A's and sh straight A's and graduate uh, uh, magna cum laude. I didn't say that right, but. But they go out there on their way to hell. On their way. On their way. So that leaves a door of opportunity open where they could still be saved. I'm not saying that it's over. It's the wash. But they're on their, their trajectory is pointed towards damnation. Separation from God. Instead of thirsting after righteousness, they're thirsting after going to hell. Damnation. Come on, people. We can't interpret this scripture to mean that your children get 18, send them off to college, 80% of them are going to be on the fast track to hell, no matter how poor, successful they are in college, in academics, or unsuccessful they are in academics, still headed to hell. And look at this, people. I'm only dealing with the 80%. What about the 20% that still stay? They don't leave the faith. Most of, I would dare say 95% of them are not even converted. Y'all just don't know how bad and dark it is. The modern form of Christianity today that we have today in our world has painted the world with a black brush. This is not real Christianity. I don't care if you keep the Sabbath, you're Catholic, Mormon, Buddhist. Or, no, we're not Buddhist. But but uh, Church of God in Christ, whatever. SBC, this is not no Christianity, y'all. This ain't no Christianity. It don't look like nothing in the Bible. Nothing. It's antithetical to everything that we see in the Bible. That Jesus promote it. Look at this, people. If you're going to look at this scripture, therefore shall a man leave his mother and father. When it, when this, the only context that you can read this scripture in, based on Genesis chapter 1, verse 25 through 27, where it says, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. The only way that you can look at this text is in the context of you catching a vision. The husband, when he's married, he catched the vision of God. And he gets a he gets a an assignment from God apart from the assignment of his mother and father. Apart from. But his vision and assignment from God to build and seek first and exclusively the kingdom of God, guess what? It converges with his mother's and his mother and his father. That's the only way you can look at this text. God is never meant for families to be independent atoms. How else will you ever grow a kingdom? A kingdom. How, pray tell. You can't grow no kingdom if everybody keep breaking off. And there's no unity in the body of Christ. The real body of Christ. I'm not talking about this churchy Christianity stuff. Look, people. The first component that you have is you got to have a personal relationship with God. I get it. I get it. You got to have an individual encounter with God. You, you, you have to be born again. After you're born again, if you're really born again, you're not going to want to marry nobody that's not seeking first the kingdom of God. And you're certainly not going to try to marry somebody you can't convince of the beauty and magnitude of the kingdom of God. You're not going to do that. Come on, people. 
You ain't gonna go marry a heathen and raise up confused children? Tears in the church. No, no. So after you have your individual, your personal relationship with God, if you're seeking first the kingdom of God, that means you're seeking first God and his righteousness. Righteousness is the kingdom of God, Ellen G. White says. <laughs> the kingdom of God is righteousness and the righteousness is the kingdom of God. Anything outside the parameters, the borders of the kingdom of God. I'm speaking in metaphorical language in the Holy Ghost. It's not of God. It's not of God. When you get this mate, guess what y'all also are going to have? As a couple, you're going to have an assignment to dominate the world with a population and ideal ide ideology of God's kingdom. But no, that's not what we have today. Oh, no. Mm -mm. We don't have that today. Christians marry anybody they think look cute. Anybody that's going to advance their temporal uh, their temporal goals. Now, I'm not against temporal goals. But your temporal goals cannot eclipse eternal ones. Your, your temporal goals will be nestled nested, incubated inside eternal goals. Not vice versa. <laughs> oh boy. So when it says the man shall leave his mother and father, father and mother, and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. One flesh what? One flesh to work with. Your parents, kingdom parents, to exponentially grow the kingdom of God so it can dominate the world with kingdom philosophy, ideology, technology, science. We're not doing that, y'all. That's how you know this stuff ain't Christianity. I don't care what religion. I don't care if they keeping this. They claim to be keeping the seven day Sabbath, the first day Sabbath, the whatever Sabbath. This stuff ain't kingdom, y'all. It's not kingdom. It's not kingdom. The only thing that we're being fruitful and multiplying with is spreading, is building up the kingdoms of the world. That's the only thing we're being fruitful and multiplied with is building up the kingdoms of the world, the kingdoms of this temporal government, the kingdom of banking debt and loans. That's the only thing we're being fruitful and multiply. So God is not saying break up my kingdom when he says Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave unto his wife, and they shall become one flesh. No. He's basically telling him to catch the vision. How do I know that? Because if you look at the first man and the first woman, God was not telling Adam to break, break a loose from... Uh, God was not telling Adam to break a loose from him. The father of Adam is God. And break a loose from earth, which would be the mother. You you follow you follow me. I'm speaking in the Holy Ghost. Some of y'all are not going to get this. This is some spiritual talking here, but it has a literal and practical application. Now, if if. If God is in fact telling men and women that are born again to leave your father and mother, he would have had to been tell he would have had to tell Adam this. I mean, when I say leave, I'm saying in the context of you know, leave them. Like we do. 
put our parents in nursing homes, that is not of God. That's how you know you're not building up the kingdom of God. You got all these Christians in nursing homes. Where are their children at? Most of them in the world. And the ones that's not in the world, no matter what denomination. They're putting their parents in nursing home and letting other, other people whose parents is in nursing home take care of them. This is madness. We call this building up the kingdom of God? Whoa. We letting the state take care of our parents. Why? Because we don't have an idea and, and, and infrastructure thoughts on how to build the kingdom in being fruitful and multiplying and replenishing the earth and subduing it. We don't have a notion of that. Look, watch this. I want to prove to you that we don't have a notion of this. Watch. In, in the West, primarily, which I would call the hub of what we call the gospel. Why is it that in the West, there is no notion of, the only notion that we have of, have of the kingdom is family? Why? Why pray? Why pray tell? We don't have any concept of clan, tribes, houses, like in, 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 in the context of house of David, house of Saul, house of, you know, in that context, family. We can't even keep a family together. <laughs> um, I don't care if we speak in the Holy Ghost, go to church on the Sabbath, on Sunday, Monday, Wednesday night prayer meeting, I don't care. We can't keep no family together. We can't keep family together as Sabbath school teachers, priests, nuns. I mean, nuns and priests in a Catholic church. <laughs> That's a wash. They teach that they priests can't even get married. How you going to build a kingdom of God up? He said, be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth and subdue it. I grant you that procreation is not the only way to grow the kingdom of God. I get it. But it's one of the, it's the primary way. It's the primary way. Why do I say that? What's my evidence for that? If Adam and Eve had not procreated and they would have died, the kingdom of God would not have grown. So it is a primary way. People, this is crazy. We have no concept I'm the family prophet to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. So this is you all, this is all in my part. <laughs> Look at this. Family. Tribe. Clan. Houses. Dynasties. <laughs> People in the West don't know nothing about a dynasty. A empire. A kingdom. Now, you could argue some of the, or the order that I took. It don't matter. We still, we can't even, Christians can't even stay married. <laughs> Christians hate their wives. You really can say that now. Over 50% of Christians can't stay married. What does that say about the ones that stay married? Most of them, they can't get along. People, it is pretty bad. Most of them are marriages of convenience. You would have to say that. Looking at the first sector of this statistic, you would have to say that. Christians got women on the side, other families, girlfriends, wife swapping, open Christians with open marriages. People, it's bad. Very few Christian couples. Christian, I'm just talking Christian, no matter what denomination. We don't even know what a family is for. A family was supposed to turn into, develop into a larger 
kingdom that denomin dominates the earth. Oh, boy. Okay. All right, I'm done. I'm telling you, it's a lot in that scripture. I. It's so much the Holy Ghost is overloading me with, I can't even go on. You got Christians now. They want gay marriages. Polyamorous marriages. Polyamorous, that's a that's a that's a nasty word, a euphemism for wife swapping. That's all it is. They say they're not wife, but polyamorous means that you just a whore. Husband and wife. I call the women whores. And I call the, the win, men moors. Whores and moors. That's all a polyamorous family is. Relationship. It's just an open marriage. Christians are getting in this. Who, who say they love Jesus with all their heart. And they say love is love. <laughs> but anyway. I got stuck there. I'm sorry y'all. But if, if, if you don't get nothing else from this Sabbath school lesson, that you got enough right there. <laughs> Praise God. So let's keep going. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. And they shall and they were and they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said unto the woman, Yea, have God said, Ye shall not eat of the tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden. Look at this. Satan says, Yea, have God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said unto the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God have said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. Now, some people argue whether or not, <clears throat> whether or not, some people debate whether or not God said touch it. I'm going to go with he said he didn't say touch it. I, I'm going to go with that because, you know, my wife recently showed me a statement where uh, one of the founders of our church wrote a book. I forget what book it is. I think it was Great Controversy. I'm, I'm not sure where God did. She says that God told her not to touch it. And so I'm going to go with that. But don't forget this, people. There were two trees in the midst of the garden. R remember that. Both of the trees were in the midst of the garden. So they were in relatively some close proximity as it relates to the, the parameters of the midst of the garden. Okay? But Satan well knows what Eve is talking about and what tree she is speaking of. Because the very tree that she's speaking of is the one that she, for the most part, could have been standing in front of when she was talking to this devil. But of the fruit of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, God hath said, ye shall not eat of it, neither shall you touch it, lest ye die. John the Baptist said, Now is the axe laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit shall be hewn down and cast into the fire. Now is the axe laid at the root of the tree, and every tree that bringeth forth not good fruit shall he be hewn down and cast. The, the, this tree here, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it represents the tares. It represents the Laodicean leaders that are apostate. I didn't say that they wasn't popular. I didn't say that they were not lauded on 3ABN. And, and I, I didn't say that. And Sky Angel and, 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 and all of this. 
and lauded by the the uh, medical institutions within the conclave of the Seventh Day Adventist Church or the theological community. I didn't say that. Usually, when you have, if you're going to have a tree of life in any denomination, the ones that are going to be most lauded are going to be those that represent the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Really. In any denomination, any, anyone. Not just little tiny cults and doomsday cults. Mm -mm. The huge denominations that lie about their numbers. We have 16 million members. Those, 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 those leaders. Biblical research committees. Seminaries. The, the most educated and erudite theological leaders in those institutions, they're going to be devils. I'm not saying none of them are good. I'm not saying that you don't have your Nicodemuses. I'm not saying that you don't have your uh, Joseph of Arathia. I'm not saying that. I'm saying as a corporate body of leaders, it's, it's, it's pretty much demonic. It's a demonic, it's a demonic cancer. No matter where you look. These are the people that the wheat need to radiate the love of God to the most. And these are the very ones that we need to fight with the artillery of the fruits of the spirit. There's a dichotomy. You have to love them with the fruits of the spirit. And you got to war against them with the armor of God. And the fruits of the spirit too. And nobody's teaching this. And in every denomination, a war is going on. There are faithful people in every single denomination, but the denominations as they stand are cauldrons of sin, broken cisterns of iniquity. But of the tree, which is in the midst of the garden, wicked leaders, trees in the Bible represent leaders. God has said, trees in the Bible represent leaders. We see this in Ezekiel chapter 47. The Bible says that uh, a fountain of David shall be opened up and uh, this river that Ezekiel sees, it, uh, it, it gets wider and deeper and broader as it goes on. And there are trees on either side of this river, which I would call life. And the serpent said unto the woman, ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day that you eat thereof, your eyes shall be open. Now here is a leader, the devil, an angel, messenger. You like that, don't you? Messenger, a religious leader who's teaching in a place that was meant for the growth of God's kingdom. He's teaching in the garden. This reminds me of, of 2 Thessalonians. Sitting in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. The temple of God was the garden of Eden. That was like the most holy place of the garden of Eden, if you will. Satan comes right up in there. Why is this not being taught in these churches? It can't be taught in these churches. It can't be taught in these Christian denominations, this churchianity. It can't be. You know why? Because the ones that have are in the positions to teach, they represent the devil. The devil's not going to rat on himself. So you're never going to get a teaching like this in any Sabbath school. You, I mean, it can't be tolerated. You have to go to jail, call the police. They have to defrock you from being the Sabbath school teacher or Sunday school teacher, whatever. And when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes. When sin is conceived. 
Mm. And the tree to be desired to make one wise. The desire to make one wise was actually the temptations of Satan. Wow. You can't find one denomination that has not fallen for temptation, let alone repent of any temptation or confess. That's why nobody has ever heard in modern time of the phrase corporate repentance in any SBC conference, Seventh-day Adventist general conference, any of them. All they do is brag and boast and parade out people from different countries and flaunt their pretentious branches bereft of any fruit of the spirit in the face of God at every general conference session. Every single one. Oh, God, save us. The tares are tempting us. By the way, tares are always the majority. Always. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and it and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were open, and they knew that they were naked. You know what I see? They knew that they had sinned. They knew that they were warring against the love of God. That's what commandments are, people. The name of this Sabbath school lesson is Christ and the law. The law is a transcript of God's character of love. They saw that they were naked of that love. Yeah, I know they had light on them. We get all that. But their love for God had waned when they violated the law, the commandment. Oh, well, it wasn't no law back then. Even Seventh-day Adventist ministers hate the word law. Oh, yeah, they're defending and give a revelation seminar or amazing fact talking about the beautifulness, the, talking about the, the, the attributes of the law. But secretly, you talk to these guys, they don't like law. They don't. If they are led to sins, how could it be any other way? And did eat and gave also unto her husband with her and he did eat. Let me tell you something, y'all. I've said this before in other videos, but I had over almost 300 videos now. <sighs> if Eve was the only one that had ate of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you know what God was going to do? Not nothing stupid. Like these people say, kill her. I've heard men say God was going to just kill Eve and replace her. These people do not know what their what spirit they are. And most of these people that say this are all men. God would have just killed Eve. Ooh, wee! These people will say this and won't blink. Their spirit is not stirred. And it lets me know that their hearts are hardened. God was going to kill Eve? Why he didn't kill both of them then? He didn't kill both of them because one of them was a man. Whoa! Whoa! Demon! Demon! It's Christians that believe this! Let me tell you what really would have happened. We get, we already know what it happened. It's all through the Bible. Oh, Lord, Jesus, keep me near the cross. <laughs> Boy, if Eve would have been the only one to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God would have used Adam to save her. 
I'm not saying that Jesus would not have had to come. Jesus still would have come and died just for Eve. Yeah, one person. Do we really get how much God loves us and what's at stake here? Do we really get a glimpse of what really happened at Calvary? Do we really understand? Because we act as some fools. God would have killed Eve if Adam didn't eat. No, that, that sounds like Satan. God would have killed that. God wouldn't have killed Eve. God would have saved Eve. Je God would have, if Eve was the only sinner on earth, Jesus would have, and it was seven billion people on earth, Jesus would have come and just died for Eve. We don't understand Calvary then. Just got like God is using Christians to save the world, trying to use Christians, just like God wants to use Christians to save the world. God would have used Adam to, to save Eve, to evangelize Eve, to bring her back, to gather the fragments that nothing be lost. Oh, I've heard men tell me this. I've heard people say this in Sabbath school. Sunday schools. I've heard this on internet. Really? Oh. Amazing. <sighs> and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. And he did eat. And the eyes of both of them were open. How was the eyes of them open? Well, it was certainly was open to the fact that they did something God said don't do. But it also was open to the fact, I believe, that they needed a redeemer now. They needed a redeemer. They needed salvation. They had fallen from the grace of God. They was not perfectly representing the love, the transcript of God's character. And they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves apron. What about run to the Father? Why are we still hiding? Anywhere you, any denomination you look at in Christianity is hiding from God and have mended for themselves aprons. That's why you can go to a general conference session in any denomination or the equivalent of any general conference session in any denomination and not one, you won't see anybody get on their face and repent of sin. You will see none of the leaders fall on their face and confess particular, specific sin. You won't see it. It don't happen. That's how you know we're wearing fake leaves. That's how you know we are wearing fig leaves. Oh, Lord. It's bad, y'all. It is bad. Bad. Can you believe I'm still on this first text? Ooh, that's some good word there. Oh, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. So, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those that keep the commandments of God. Look, look at this. What is the law? The laws... What is sin? Let's look at sin. Sin is the transgression of the laws. Let me give it to you this way. Sin is the transgression 
of the outline of God's character that governs his kingdom. I'm, I'm astounded by the Sabbath school lesson and all of the Sabbath school lessons I've been watching on uh, YouTube where people are teaching about this lesson, which is all about the law and everything. And the word kingdom don't even come up. The reason why the word kingdom do not come up is because we are not seeking the kingdom. Oh, we want to be nice people so we can go build up the kingdoms of the world and make the banks richer by getting loans. Student loans, home loans, car loans, selling our souls to the bank. The word kingdom don't come up. How can you say law? How can you talk about the law of God and not even mention the words and the notion of kingdom? How? Now, this is a whole quarterly on it. We are not kingdom citizens. Go back and look at any of the Sabbath school lessons. And this is not me trying to tear down everybody else and, and, and exalt myself. I'm just saying. The word kingdom don't even come up. And some of you out there are going to think that I'm just being superficial and just saying, well, long as he thinks that as long as you say the word kingdom, that is kingdom. No. I'm just saying that they don't even do that. They don't even have that form. They don't even go, they don't even go through form. They don't even try to fake the form. Forget about the the actual substance behind the idea of mentioning the word kingdom. Sin is a transgression of the laws that are transcript or outline of God's character of love that governs his kingdom. That's what the law is. I was looking at one Sabbath school lesson where uh, this this guy who teaches the Sabbath school lesson is all, and is all he, he, ad nauseum. He's so hooked on. He's so hooked on the penal substitution, combating the penal substitutionary atonement and kindred philosophies. He can't even see the kingdom. And whenever he mentions the word kingdom, it's like a it's like having a token African American work African American working in a corporation f with 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 millions of Caucasians. You could tell it's only token. It's only form when he says it. Because his whole ministry is built is built around exposing the lies. Lies. No, no. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Revealing the truth is what exposes lies. And I know that he would argue, well, that's, that's actually what I'm doing. No, you're not. Because if you was, you would get into kingdom philosophy. You're not getting into it. And I've been listening to this guy for nine months. It, it, are there some facts in some of the things that he says? Yeah. Do I get some things? Yeah. But when I grab his facts, they become truth in my life. They're not just facts. God bless him. I think he's doing the best that he knows how. <clears throat> but let me say this. We have to hunger and thirst after righteousness. We have to, people. Sabbath school class has been reduced over the years. And Sunday school class. A lot, of, a lot of churches don't even have Sunday school anymore. They can't have Sunday school anymore.
And Sabbath school in the Seventh Day Adventist Church has been reduced to just something that you just get through just to hear one person speak without the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Just to pass time. So you can collect a tithe and offering and give it to the bank. So the bank can be made richer through the deposits and to make more loans. That's basically we the the, the Seventh Day Adventist Church, like all the other churches, have become a slave to the bank. You even have uh, these churches even run to the the bank right away to deposit the money. That's how you know we're slaves. But anyway, as if the the bank is the storehouse of God. If the bank is the storehouse of God, why is it that the, the, the worldly banks don't come to our storehouse and get loans and borrow money? See, this is this stuff is of Satan, y'all. Straight up Satan worship. Baal worship. Mammon, more appropriately. Let's look at the memory text. <laughs> I'm just on the memory tag. Why the Holy Ghost is taking over here? Oh boy, I, I, I'm like skipping the rest of these scriptures. Here is the patience of the saints. Ah. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. And have the faith of Jesus. What is that text? I'm going to unpack that for you. Oh, boy, some teaching going on today. Good grief. See, as I'm teaching, God is teaching me stuff as I'm talking. It's like amazing. I'm getting downloads. Watch this. If, look at this, people. Write this down. Don't, don't turn off the video. Write this down, people. This is so beautiful. What is the law? The law is the transcript transcript of God's the law is a transcript or outline of God's character of love that governs his kingdom empowers his kingdom galvanizes his kingdom that's what the law is. I was listening to a guy and he was, oh, was teaching in Sabbath school class. And he was saying, you know, they read this statement over in uh, Mount of Blessings. Boy, I wish I could put my finger on this right now. Boy, this would be a beautiful little nugget for you guys for this Sabbath school class. I want to try to find it as I'm talking. So now, now I am uh, multitasking here. But, and I was listen, listening to one of the uh, people that was sitting in the audience of this class, and they, and, and they often misquote this statement of Ellen G. White, where she says that boy, I do not want to misquote this. Okay, you, you got to bear with me. And I don't edit my videos. So, uh, it's in Mount of Blessings, though. Oh, thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. Let me see. Let me see if I can put Oh, good. Thoughts from the Mount of Blessings. And in this statement, oh, boy, I do not want to misquote this, this statement. Especially, mm. okay, she talks about, she says that it, the angels, the thought that there was a, oh, I'm going to have to come back to that. 
because I'm trying to find it while I'm talking to you and teach this lesson. So I can't do all of those at the same time. But uh, it was something to the effect. I'm going to I don't want to misquote it. It's something to the effect that the angels. Many people say they were surprised that there was a law. And a lot of people what's happening with a lot of people is that they are deducing from that that the angels the law didn't exist well the reason why they're coming to that conclusion because they don't know what the law is the law of God's kingdom is a transcript or outline of God's character by which his kingdom operates exists and grows and is galvanized by and supported by any other adjectives that you can think of what the angels were surprised not, not surprised but what they were you know they had to take a double take on was this not the fact that that they didn't know the character of God, because that's what the law is. Is he outlined a transcript of God's character? What they were really discombobulated about was the fact that there was somebody, a being, that was so rebellious that the law had to had another facet to it in that rebellion was growing that would have been the only surprise they were familiar with who God was. They loved to serve him. They loved to do his will. They loved to do whatever he said. They eagerly waited and wished that God would tell them to do something. They were not like adults are and teenagers are. I always got to do something. Oh, I can't I do what I want to do. No, 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 no. So you have people running around saying that the law really didn't exist. But these people don't know what the law is. And one of the foundations of not really knowing what the law is, is that you're not seeking first the kingdom. You can't even see it. Jesus told Nicodemus that you can't even see the kingdom of God. How are you going to know what the law means? How are you going to be able to really unpack, understand properly what the law of God is? If you can't see first the kingdom, you can't even see. If you're not born again, you can't even see the kingdom of God. Now, I'm gonna, I want to give some leeway here. I won't say that everybody that doesn't understand properly what the law is, is not born again, but they not mature in righteousness. Maybe they are born again. I will give them that. But they are not skillful in righteousness. They're not. Especially if they're saying there was no law. If you say that there was no law, you got to say that there was no God. We're looking at the law as tables of stone. That's carnal thinking, man. That's not kingdom thinking. The reason why God had to give the, the, the children of Israel the Ten Commandments written on stone is because they weren't kingdom thinking. God was trying to show them his character. How it was supposed to be displayed in them. Apparently, if he gives them Ten Commandments, they're doing all the stuff in those commandments. They're not like God. They're not born again as a nation. They are, in fact, Israel after the flesh. Come on, y'all. There was no law. If you say that there was no law or no commandments, that, that means that there was no God. 
God said, let there be light, and there was light. Light was happy to bow down before God and, 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 and fling its rays. Out over the creation that God was constructing in Genesis chapter one. Light was light, light, light was ready to evade the darkness, invade the darkness, and happy that it had an assignment. And the assignment was a commandment. God said, Let there be light, and light said, Okay, oh boy, he finally he using me. But we don't look at God's commandments as like, like that. That's why you got some Sabbath school teachers on YouTube teaching that there was no commandments. There was no law. The angels were surprised that there were some commandments. No, they were surprised because of a contrast that somebody didn't want to serve God. That's the only way. I'm sure there are others, but this would have been the main way that caused the conundrum for the angels. Evil existed. God tell you to do something? You're like, oh boy, he, I'm next. He's telling me to do something. He's asking me to do something. Yes, it's a command too. It's a command in the context that It's a command. It, it, it's a command as much as it's a command to the angels in the context that they know it has to be done. They love to do His will, but but now you got now you got Seven Day Adventist people who said they're teaching the latter rain. They are actually teaching. And if you go back to a Sabbath school lesson, I think that I'm studying, looking at their lesson twelve. One of the one of the uh, the uh, teachers that teach when uh, this guy's gone, and I'll say his name, Tim Jennings. He said the angels were surprised. Yeah, you can read that and get that out of that. I could see, I could comprehend why they would get that out of that. But the reasons why, and interpret it that way. But I don't interpret it that way. It's like, man. The angel's like, what? Somebody don't do want to do your will? Somebody's saying something opposite of God? And in context to doing God's will and his character, See, that's what the law of God is. It's a transcript of God's character of love that supports his kingdom. Now you got people teaching, you got Adventist teacher who said they got the latter rain because their ministry is built around uh, exposing the lies. See, I, I'm not into that exposing lies. I, I want to expose the truth. You know, and to some of you all, it might sound like tomato, tomato. Both of y'all saying the same thing. Because mm -mm -mm -mm. if you look at the nuance, if you compare the nuances, you will see that it's different. But anyway, I, I'm just putting this out here. Maybe he'll get it. Maybe they'll get it. The people that get it, because if it's one person believing this, Teaching a Sabbath school class is millions of people believe in this. So, but it, I would have to say it's it's another lie. The angels didn't know that there was a law. They didn't know that they. What 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 what, what makes this really bad? Well, let me go on. Let me see how far I got. Boy, hour already. You said, oh, you didn't go over the whole lesson. B believe me, you're going to get way more out of this Sabbath school lesson than you're going to get out of the one that you're going to go to on Sabbath. Get, trust me. For the for most of you, believe me. I just gave you a ceiling message. 
I just gave you a prophetic message. I just gave you a message that's worthy of sealing the 144,000. Literal 144,000. Yeah, in number. Yeah. Just, just, yeah. In number. This is a sealing message. The gospel of the kingdom. Nothing can substitute it. Jesus didn't substitute it with anything else. So, we, on Sabbath afternoon, wow, some teaching can really go on, boy. Because I'm just looking at this lesson, there's so many other things that I could say. But I'm just going to give you that, and I'm going to close right here, because before this week is over, I want to do a uh, lesson, I want to do lesson 13. And so, you know, these lessons, you know, it, it's it, sometimes it takes a lot out of me. <laughs> but I pray to God that you hear my heart. I love the tears. If I was a tear, I would want the wheat to love me. Somebody had asked me, what are you angry at? I said, I'm angry at our condition. Uh, I'm angry at our condition as Laodiceans. God never says anything good about Laodiceans, not one thing. But you go to our general conference session and all you can see is antichrist activity. Because all they say is good things. That's how you know it's antichrist. Nobody gets on their face, repent, confess particular sins at a general conference session. Even a local church. If it's not happening at the head, it's not going to happen nowhere else in the body. But anyway, may the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. This is prophet six, family prophet to the angel, the church of the lay to the lay of the sins, signing out. Maranatha.